Please rise as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel today is Luke 16, 19 to 31. Once there was a rich person who dressed in purple and linen and feasted splendidly every day. At the gate of this person's estate lay a beggar named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the scraps that fell from the rich person's table, and even the dog came and licked out Lazarus' sores. One day, poor Lazarus died and was carried by angels to the arms of Sarah and Abraham. The rich person likewise died and was buried. In Hades, in torment, the rich person looked up and saw Sarah and Abraham in the distance and Lazarus resting in their company. Sarah and Abraham, the rich person cried, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am tortured by these flames. But they said, my child, remember that you are well off in your lifetime, while Lazarus was in misery. Now Lazarus had found consolation here, and you have found torment. But that's not all. Between you and us, there is a fixed chasm, so that those who might wish to come to you from here can't do so, nor can anyone cross from your side to us. The rich person said, I beg you then to send Lazarus to my own house, where I have five siblings. Let Lazarus be a warning to them, so that they may not end in this place of torment. But Sarah and Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let your siblings hear them. Please, I beg you, the rich person said, if someone would only go to them from the dead, then they would repent. If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, Sarah and Abraham replied, they won't be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. This ends the reading of the Gospel. <laughs> that's tucked behind all the dusty books of the Bible. I know you're all very familiar with Nahum, Zephaniah, and Haggai. Yeah, it's right next to those books. <laughs> and only three chapters long, Habakkuk doesn't really give any easy answers. The prophet prays concerning why God's will is not being accomplished. He says, Lord, how long must this flouting of your will go on? The prophet was interceding for his people, the people of Judea, who were under attack by the Babylonians. The next question Habakkuk asked complained that the so-called bad guy always won. Lord, how can you punish us with people who are more unrighteous than we? Isn't that the question of the day? Because how do you explain that God is just, especially when women still don't have equal pay? and with widespread and even institutionalized marginalization and hatred towards trans people and gender non-conforming and gender non-binary people. When lesbians, gay men, and bisexuals lose house and home just for loving who they love, and people of color have to fight even harder now just to breathe. Habakkuk has been used by Christians throughout the ages on a number of occasions. The Apostle Paul quotes Habakkuk 2.4 in his letter to the Galatians. The church in Galatia was concerned about all the new converts were not living as they ought. 
that their Christianity did not look Christian enough. Fast forward 1,800 years later, during the American Civil War, literate slaves read Habakkuk against the backdrop of literal bondage and captivity. Can you hear them plead, Lord, how can you punish us with people who are more unrighteous than we? Perhaps the most fascinating historical use of Habakkuk that I have seen can be found during the War of Northern Aggression, which is code word for the Civil War. Christian slave owners of the South distributed tracts quoting Habakkuk, asking, why do the Northern states oppress the Southern economy? And most recently, I noticed Christian fundamentalists, probably imagining themselves oppressed, cry out to God in agony because their personal biases and prejudices are not being adhered to by society anymore. Habakkuk, though, is not unique. The prophet merely extends a question from the psalmist. But instead of complaining about foreigners in general as being the oppressors of the psalms, Habakkuk focuses on the all too real oppression of the Babylonians who took their land. So, as an oppressed prophet, was it okay for Habakkuk to wonder if God really saw what was going on in Judea? They were being killed. They were being enslaved. And is it okay if we wonder where on earth is God? Some religious people feel zero remorse when they verbally abuse LGBTQ plus communities. They would rather be right than just. Additionally, these everyday Christians take no responsibility for the pain involved with sexuality, perpetual rejection, depression, and sometimes, tragically, suicide. They wonder how God can allow such evil things to happen. How long will you forget me, Lord, forever? Yet many return, turn away from God and never ask the question anymore. It frustrates me that there is even a need for something like the Trans Visibility March in D.C. that took place yesterday, but I'm glad it happened. We are in the midst of several civil rights moments. The continuation of the civil rights movement from the 1950s, Me Too, fighting for a clean environment, <clears throat> trans visibility, and the crossroads of all of these. We are experiencing intersectionality as a nation. And it is uncomfortable for most, and many people have given up. But for us, that is not an option. Why? Well, Sean Demons, director of the community engagement for the Trans Visibility March, said, there's an epidemic now of murders of black trans women. There have been 19 trans women murdered in the US this year, and all of them have been black. I don't hear about this anywhere other than within our own communities, he says. And Habakkuk might say, how long will you forget me, Lord? Forever? People, especially women, are ridiculed when they speak out against their sexual abusers and say, me too. How long? The planet's resources are being depleted and nothing is being left for later generations. How long? Our oceans and lakes are filled with carcinogens, plastics, and other pollutants, so there will be no drinking water left for later generations. How long? There will be no social security for people my age or anyone younger. How long? Healthcare and education are seen as luxury items, not as human rights. How long? Hunger and homelessness is at an all-time high because of reckless policies and unprosecuted white-collar crimes. How long? And if you thought your vote could help change these policies, it might not in this country. Because the voice, the vote, of lower-income families are not being counted in some districts due to gerrymandering and voter suppression. How long. Where, by the way, is God in all this mess? 
Does God even care that people live in bondage? Does it matter to God that there are innocent lives that are being destroyed? Where is God when the oppressed are suffering? And why do those, quote, bad guys always seem to win? As we see, one of the biblical discourses that deals exclusively with oppression, Habakkuk, fails to provide easy answers. But the Apostle Paul provides some insight. To the church, Paul writes that they get to be slaves for eternity. That's comforting. Only this time, slaves to righteousness. However, the Greek word here, dikaiosune, carries two meanings. Righteousness, while at the same time, justice. Dikaiosune. Most of the time in the New Testament, when our Bibles say righteousness, they forget to include and justice. Dikaiosune. In the first century, religious righteousness cannot be conceived without having a strong sense of justice. Accordingly, it's not enough to be righteous without being just. Remember the whole thing with the Confederates? Yeah, they probably thought they were righteous. Slavery is biblically sanctioned, by the way. But in the actual Bible, the Greek New Testament, they're only living into half of the passage only righteousness. Because where is the justice? There was none. Think about all the issues I raised and consider that there is an opposing side to each one of those. While one side is blaming the other for not being righteous, at the same time they forget about justice. Are we brave enough to step back and ask ourselves, in what ways might we be righteous without being just? In what ways might we be self-righteous? Acts tells us that righteousness is not the be-all, end-all of living a good life. In one passage, a vision is received. The question is whether or not just anybody is eligible to become a Christian. People were circumcised according to Jewish law, but it was unusual that Peter would spend so much time eating with Gentiles who were not observant of the law. Like when some Christians have an ick factor about the LGBTQ plus communities. There's definitely an ick factor for these historic Jews when it comes to non-Jews. They don't want Peter to eat with Gentiles. Ick. They want Peter to spend more time with people who adhere to the law. Once again, righteousness. Pause. Note the word the kaiosune is not mentioned here. Peter has a vision, and it's all about justice. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. In other words, no more ick factor. Instead, like the first reading said, everything is holy now. So what does this look like for righteousness and justice to exist together? Well, as regards the American Civil War, it came in the form of emancipation. You see, the other side, the Union, was righteous too, but also just, at least more so than the Confederates. Further, righteous and justice together could look like reparations being given with interest, adjusted for inflation. Righteousness and justice together might look like the governor opposing her party by vetoing an anti-trans bathroom bill. But what might this mean for us as a community of faith? How might we practically resist forces of oppression in the world? In today's Gospel reading, there is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus is disempowered and is begging for food and water at the table of a rich man. But why was he begging? This is where I feel some of us can relate to this story. Maybe he was a runaway gay youth. The Bible doesn't say. Maybe his parents disowned him for coming out as trans. Maybe he lost his job in housing because of now legal discrimination based on his self-identity. The Bible says Lazarus was covered with sores. Could that have been Kaposi's sarcoma? Was he yet another victim of AIDS? 
we don't really know. But what we do know is this, Lazarus was a beggar in life. Even worse, the religious people of the day would have called him an abomination, an abomination because of his sores. Talk about ick factor. Like the opposite of the Good Samaritan, they would cross to the other side of the street had they seen him in advance. But then the tables turned. In death, Lazarus no longer begs for food and water at the table of the rich man. Instead, the rich man begs for even a drop of water from the tip of Lazarus's finger. And this is making me very thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I needed that drop of water. <laughs> so let this be clear. This is not proof that there is going to be a hell. This is not proof that people who suffer in life will receive eternal rewards. Let's look beyond the surface. Jesus is consistent in proclaiming what thy kingdom come looks like throughout these chapters leading up to his trial and execution. In Jesus' telling of this story, he doesn't really care about what those sores are or whether Lazarus had AIDS or even how he got it because he doesn't mention any of that. Jesus esteems Lazarus by knowing his name in the story. In fact, Jesus only gives a name to the poor man. The rich man is nameless here, meaning he could represent anyone or any policy or any corporation that ignores the needs of others. If we believe that Jesus is the herald of God, then at minimum we can walk away with this message. God sees the plight of the oppressed and the disenfranchised. God sees. If we believe that Jesus is God, then we walk away with this message. God sees the plight of the oppressed and disenfranchised and cares. Here, and in Acts, what God has made clean you must not call profane, because it doesn't matter to God. In this passage, God is concerned about how unjust the situation was. That trans visibility march, God sees, God cares, and it is up to us to make a difference by the power of God. Those natural resources, the habitability of the planet, and the future and livelihood of the next generation, God sees, God cares, and it is up to us. The fight for human rights, such as health care and education, God cares, it is up to us. Hunger and homelessness, voter suppression, me too, God sees, God cares, it is up to us. It is up to us. The problem with all these issues is that if we leave them unaddressed, we leave millions of people, or at least the disempowered in our community, to say to God, how long will you forget me, Lord? Forever? Because God sees, God notices. And today's gospel tells us that God notices when we don't notice. So let us be the hands and feet of God for everything is holy now. We can choose to do what is right and just. We can bring healing to our surrounding communities. We can bring healing to the disadvantaged and disempowered right here in this building. Remember, righteousness and justice cannot be conceived without the other. So whether you're reading Habakkuk or Psalms, Galatians or Acts, or the Gospel of Luke, the answer to that age-old question, how long, Lord, will you forget me, will be for us and for those whom we care about. This is God speaking now. I see, I care, and it is up to you. Amen. Amen.